So let me introduce, we have, we have five uh, different panelists who represent really a spectrum of, of work across bronchiectasis and NTM. So I'll introduce them uh, and then uh, probably ask them each to talk about the work that they're doing um, and, um, and how it applies both to NTM and bronchiectasis. So first is Steve Lisi, who is the CEO and Chairman of the Board of AIT Therapeutics. Dr. Jurgen Froelich, who is the Chief Medical Officer of Aradime. John Kowalczyk, who is the Vice President of Sales for Electromed. Dr. Paul Streck, who is the Chief Medical Officer of Insmed. And last but not least, Bill Akins, who is the Director of Specialty Pharmacy Development for Maxor Specialty Pharmacy. So welcome, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to be here. So why don't we start? And then, of course, there's Dr. Winthrop, who I'm going to make him earn his, pe his keep today. by the podium. So why don't we start with Steve, and then we'll go down the line. Sure, hi. Um, oh, here's this one too there. Hi, so um, AIT um, uses a gas called nitric oxide. Um, this gas is approved uh, for use today in hospitals uh, in the ICU for mostly for um, infants, newborns who are on ventilators um, at low concentrations of nitric oxide. Our company is using high concentration nitric oxide, which uh, is bactericidal. Um, it it uh, kills uh, Hopefully everything, we're not sure yet, but uh, viruses, bacteria, fungi, et cetera. Um, we've treated uh, 12 patients uh, with NTM abscesses to date. Um, we'll have some data at ATS uh, on Tuesday. Um, and we've seen uh, some uh, eradication, but uh, we'd like to see more. Um, we have a, a generator of nitric oxide. Uh, I think some of you may have seen the, the, the device uh, in the other room. Uh, this gives us the ability to treat patients at home for a longer duration. To date, we've only been able to treat for three weeks because we have to treat in the hospital. Um, now we can treat at home, so our next study hopefully will be for a longer period of time um, and we can get uh, some, some better results. But uh, I'd like to say that even though we have just two uh, patients eradicated out of 12, we saw uh, increases in quality of life, uh, including six-minute walk and other measures, and FEV1 um, fairly consistent uh, among patients. Um, and uh, we, we hope to um, enter into our next uh, study next year, and hopefully that would be a pivotal, pivotal study, and we'd be able to uh, file for approval in the United States. Uh, this is Jürgen Fröhlich. And, uh, for, we at Aerodyne, we have developed a liposomal formulation of ciprofloxacin. Uh, we had conducted two phase three studies in non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis patients who had chronic infections with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, we had completed those two uh, phase three studies. We uh, were required by the FDA to use a, an endpoint, as the primary endpoint was uh, measuring the time to first exacerbation in a chronic disease. Uh, there was not much debate we could have. This was more or less required. Uh, we do this, we measured the frequency of exacerbations as secondary endpoints. And some of them, you might know the whole history. Uh, we, we submitted an NDA last year. The FDA reviewed us under priority review. We had an advisory committee beginning of this year. And at this advisory committee, uh, we at Aerodyne made really a very good ca uh, case for of course, looking at the primary endpoint, but frequency in these patients is very, very important. And we saw pretty good results in the reduction in frequency of exacerbations. Nevertheless, at the end, the FDA requested the advisory committee members to, to judge this new therapy by the primary endpoint time to first exacerbation, and we got a negative vote. Although most of the members said, when I look at frequency, uh, I think I see very good results, and if you had asked me for, to vote for frequency, I would, I would recommend for approval, and there was another severe population pre-specified pre in, in, in our studies, and many said, and for this severe population, I think you should approve it right now. Um, so to make a long story short, we, did a complete response. we received a complete response letter by the FDA, and the FDA required us to consider at least one two-year study placebo-controlled in non-CFBE patients uh, to further test it. Uh, we, we are currently interacting with the FDA on uh, the different requirements in this complete response letter, but in the meantime, we did submit the MAA, and it was uh, accepted and is under review. 
The EMA uh, told us many times that for them the frequency is more important and they will look at the totality of evidence, not just at the primary endpoint. So we are more hopeful for the, for the EMA. And now how does it relate to NTM? We did enroll several NTM patients in the study. We just required that they were NTM positive but would not require active therapy either at the time of enrollment or expected during the study. Uh, it's just a small number of patients and uh, this, the, the, the data we have, we cannot really tell you it's, it's, work, it's working in NTM patients for the NTM disease because we did not measure that one, but we did see responses in some NTM patients, but we did not specifically look for a non-tuberculous mycobacteria in our studies. And uh, also we, we treated, like we, uh, like the treatment paradigm is in cystic fibrosis patients, four weeks on treatment followed by, by four weeks off treatment for chronic therapy. So there are many questions how this could be used. However, we have very good non-clinical data and animal experiments and even in abscessus we had excellent effect in the animal models. So we do believe that there is a good, uh, it's a very good chance that li liposomal ciprofloxacin will work in NTM, but we need to study it. Uh, we have to also revisit the, the treatment regimen, whether we should give continuous treatment at least for a certain period of time and then switch to either uh, cyclotherapy or uh, continual treatment. Uh, so this overall, we are still encouraged and definitely to study this particular product in NTM patients would be our next step. Unfortunately, it hinges currently on us being successful in non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis with pseudomonas. Uh, we do know that many NTM patients have pseudomonas and so I think there is hope, but the, the next six to nine months will, will, will demonstrate us more whether we uh, this will be available as a product and can potentially be used off-label as well. Thanks, Jurgen. Good afternoon. I'm Paul Streck. I'm with INSMED. And first, let me start out by thanking Philip, Susan, Amy, Tracy, and certainly all the patients who have come today. Um, I think this forum is just an unbelievable thing to advance the um, management and treatment of a really challenging disease that's uh, plagued people for years. Um, I'm happy to announce that INSMED um, about six months ago had uh, its phase three trial that demonstrated uh, statistical significance, a very positive outcome in treating patients who had uh, NTM-MAC, patients with what we call refractory NTM-MAC, or those who had not responded to previous therapy. Some of them had been on therapy up to four years. So we've actually last week received word from the FDA that they've accepted our filing with the priority review. That means the FDA will need to respond to us in six months. So that means at the end of September, um, and hopefully being able to bring our, our drug, make it commercially available to patients. Um, INSMED's extremely committed to this space and recognizes that what a huge responsibility it is to improve the level of care, the level of scientific rigor around treatments for NTM, so needless to say, we're excited to be a part of all of this with you and look forward to um, you know, continuing to work with NTM-IR as well as all of the physicians and patients in the NTM community to really uh, move things forward and, and hopefully find full resolution to a very terrible disease. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is John Kowalczyk. I'm the Vice President of Sales of Mar and Marketing for Electromed, maker of the SmartFest. And first of all, let me also say uh, a deep uh, thanks uh, to the uh, organizers of this meeting. We think it's a great uh, uh, opportunity to be able to raise awareness and uh, through that awareness uh, really help countless patients. Um, Electromed is uh, dedicated to HFCWO and building the evidence which is critical um, to provide therapy access to um, airway clearance uh, therapies. 
And um, as you heard from most of the speakers today, everyone talked about the importance of airway clearance and how that can play in a really critical role in helping uh, patients stay healthy. And so Electromed is uh, focused on Again, working with some of the great thought leaders, uh, uh, many who are in this room today, uh, to uh, uh, conduct studies uh, to show how these therapies uh, can really help uh, patients. Um, recently, there has been a study that has been published uh, looking at outcomes uh, for bronchiectasis patients, not necessarily NTM, um, but looking at a year before therapy and a year after therapy, and what it showed was uh, through SmartFest therapy, they were able to reduce hospitalizations, reduce uh, antibiotic usage, reduce steroids use, uh, and 68% of the study participants uh, also found uh, an improvement in quality of life. That was followed up um, by a longitudinal look at this uh, that showed that they were able to sustain these results uh, two and a half years later. And so we think that's uh, an important step uh, but more research uh, and evidence uh, needs to be uh, uh, conducted. So we're excited to be here, and um, we're committed to uh, building the evidence so therapy access is uh, available. Thanks. Hello, uh, Bill Akins. I'm with uh, Maxor Specialty Pharmacy. I'm the Vice President of Specialty Pharmacy Development. So uh, I think I'm the only pharmacy here. Um, but just to tell you a little bit about Maxor, Specialty Pharmacy, we are a, um, a pulmonary sub-specialty uh, pharmacy. I think it was said earlier today, a doctor isn't a doctor. Well, a pharmacy isn't a pharmacy. There are differences in pharmacies. I think the best analogy I could give you all is that um, you're all suffering from NTM. Um, you don't go to your family practitioner. You go to these fine physicians in their clinics throughout the country because they're specialists. The same thing with us as a pharmacy. We're a national uh, pulmonary subspecialty. We focus in, in the rare and orphan pulmonary products uh, to support you, to help you through the maze of reimbursement, copay assistance, et cetera. This is all we do and this is what we're focused on and we partner with you to help you get many of the drugs you've, you've seen up here uh, and especially during the last session where you went through the CFTR modulators and CF. So uh, we are one of those pharmacies that distribute that product. And then for a trend, when you look at many of the pharmaceutical manufacturers that are coming out with the rare and orphan pulmonary products, um, what they do is they partner with pharmacies like us who have the specialty and the expertise from the clinical pharmacist to the case managers, et cetera. So we're here to support the clinics and to support you to get those drugs. And I think I heard earlier today that um, uh, hypertonic saline, the cost, well, we probably uh, distribute and dispense thousands of doses every month to patients throughout the country, and it's not a lot of money. It's less than $50. When I heard it's a lot of money, I was like, well, I don't know where we're getting that. But as the one doctor said, it's salt water. So uh, we're here to support you. So thank you very much. Well, thanks, everybody. So I'll, I'll, I'll um, ask the first question. So I think. There are a couple of themes that, that came out of the session today. Number one is that obviously there's an intimate relationship between bronchiectasis and NTM infection. Bronchiectasis is the anatomic abnormality that sets up shop for, for that kind of infection. And two, and most importantly, none of us are happy with the therapeutics that are available to treat either of those conditions. So it seems to me that drug development and, and a lot of clinical trials focus on CF, on bronchiectasis, and on NTM sort of in parallel rather than in conjunction. So. Let me ask Paul to start with, perhaps. Um, do you see opportunities, and what are the opportunities for drug development and drug studies to simply c cut across those different, what seem to be barriers? Yeah, you know, certainly as well, we look at our clinical trials. So we looked at patients who had NTM both with bronchiectasis and cavitary disease, so evaluating those. I think it's important when the clinical trials that we're running that we understand the specific underlying disease and how our therapies interact with those patients. Certainly, as we see, is there one magic bullet for all of these? No, clearly not. At the same time, it's ensuring that, um, you know, whether we add something to guidelines, how we evolve it, it's really got to be driven by what physicians like yourself and the ones in this room are, are, are um, 
seeing as the opportunity for you know, what the next steps are. I think our, one of our biggest challenges now is that we've seen what our drug can do in a particular population with NTM MAC. What's the appropriate next step, whether it be in um, individuals with uh, other NTM diseases or whatever the case is. We also have a phase two program with a drug that um, is specifically for non-CF bronchiectasis, specifically to interrupt that inflammatory pathway that causes all of the destruction. Will we move down to combined therapy? Eventually, yes, I'd like to say that, but again, I think it really has to be guided by physicians and patients who uh, are living in this world so we have the best understanding of what that looks like. Any other comments? Jürgen, I wanted to direct a question to you. Um, you obviously described uh, the process of, of inhaled superfloxacin, liposomal superfloxacin, and putting together a large trial and going through the, the arduous process of a FDA submission. Um, so what, what, were the, what were the lessons that you learned from your experience in trying to get a drug like this available to our patients, and what did you learn uh, in terms of the regulatory and approval process? Uh, the big, for me, the big learning is that we need to team up with the regulators, but we also need to team up uh, with uh, the patients and the patient advocacy groups. We, there needs to be an education process, not just for us, but also for the regulators, what the appropriate endpoints are, what the appropriate needs of the, of the patients are, and how to, uh, how to best address this in the confines of a regulated clinical study or clinical studies. And what, what I do hope there are many examples already uh, at the FDA. There is more influence by patient advocacy groups. There is, uh, we, we have, in, in two months, we have an, a workshop, or actually in less than two months, a workshop organized by the FDA about cystic fibrosis or non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis. To what degree NTM patients will be, or NTM treatments will be uh, mentioned there, I don't know at this point in time. But we need to form teams, not just teams within a company, but teams with the patients, with the patient advocacy groups, and with the regulators to better understand the disease and then tailor the specific drug development program according to these needs. Um, I just have a question for all you guys. I mean, how does it feel to be kind of first? <laughs> Not good. Good. No, I mean, I, I, you know, speaking from um, you know, Insmed and its perspective, it's it's certainly great when you bring something forward. I think it's a, a huge responsibility comes with it to um, discuss not just how you're going to bring your drug to market, but how are we going to improve outcomes across the board for these patients? Um, how do we um, ensure that there's access to the drug? All of those things are, you know, come with a big responsibility that we take very seriously. So um, while it feels good at the same time, I think being respectful of, um, you know, being first is a big deal to us. No, be, being first is, is extremely difficult, and uh, I'm glad that we're, we're second to Insmed because they've uh, raised awareness, so that's uh, <laughs> positive for us. Um, but, uh, you know, Jurgen makes a great point that uh, changing the FDA's mindset is a very, very difficult thing to do. They're, they're ingrained in how they think about infectious disease, and NTM um, is quite different than what they've been facing before. Like I was mentioned earlier, you take a Z pack for five days and you feel better. It's just not the case here. So, um, you know, changing their minds and convincing them of what's right in this patient population is the most difficult thing. So when you're first, it's very hard. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that's what we're here for. So, John, not to put you on the spot, but one of the other themes was uh, the importance of area clearance. That was unanimous among all the speakers. And, and so why, why hasn't there been a clinical trial uh, looking at airway clearance? And, and, and more importantly, what are the barriers? Uh, to do and try like that, especially for a relatively small company. Why don't we see um, some other trials of what we think to be a very important non-pharmacologic therapy? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that's a great, uh, a great question, uh, Dr. Tino. Um, one of the things that uh, that we're working on right now is trying to work with uh, some of the the thought leaders uh, to explore what's possible. Um, as uh, people are very, uh, very much aware, to conduct a, a clinical trial is very expensive, um, and uh, 
high frequency chest wall oscillation is a component of airway clearance uh, therapy. And um, so we're working on trying to figure out exactly how we can do that. But we're committed to trying to find um, how we can uh, leverage this type of therapy as, uh, as a component of that. Um, we're excited uh, to um, uh, uh, to look at some of the uh, academic centers uh, of of, uh, of credibility uh, to do these validation studies. Most of this, most of the work right now is basically um, 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 data collection from the company itself. Uh, we need to validate that uh, with uh, various uh, clinical studies um, um, that that to maintain that credibility. That and $100 million would help, right? That's exactly right. So, <laughs> so we'll be taking an offering in the back. <laughs> so, Jurgen, you, you mentioned that um, the importance of engaging patient groups as well as obviously physician groups. And so for you and, and everybody else on the panel, so how have you engaged NTIM, NTMIR, bronchiectasis regis registry, some other patient groups that are out there? Anybody have any examples of how you've accomplished that in your work? Um, uh, I had uh, the privilege to work in cystic fibrosis on Kaleidico, actually, and there was already an established community, and uh, the the industry had teamed up with with the CF Foundation and with with the experts, and 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 I believe what you are doing here, what uh, the, the great work that the NTMIR group has done, is bringing people continuously together and. By doing that, also work towards the goal is not just how look at our our individual disease, but look at mechanisms to demonstrate in clinical studies or in the appropriate studies that need to be done to make treatments available to the patient. That means you have to work with the regulators, but you have to work with all the experts and patients together. And and I think that a continuous interaction like you do every year, at least once, is very, very important. I think from where, where we sit at INSMED, certainly making sure that there's access to appropriate and reliable information through social media, through um, printed, uh, printed materials, whatever the case is, and I think getting feedback from NTMIR and other uh, patient groups are, are very critical for us. So when individuals have a, s symptoms and they don't know where to turn to, it's a terrible feeling as a, as a patient to not have a diagnosis, as you all know only too well. So the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, is it via Facebook, what is, or via other, um, again, social media aspects of it that you can comfortably go to to understand what options there are that you're truly making the right uh, treatment decisions and you know where to go to get that treatment and again I think certainly a part of our responsibility in a compliant way that we in the world that we live in today that we're doing that and people feel really good about that aspect of it. I'll just uh, throw a question in your guys' way. It, it might be interesting for people in the audience to know uh, a little bit about the orphan disease pathway and uh, and also the pathway for devices and how they differ and maybe you guys could comment on that. Um, and just, I'll comment as an epidemiologist, I mean, these are orphan diseases, quote unquote, and there's a definition for that. Uh, you know, the, the incidence are, can't exceed, or the prevalence can't exceed 200,000 uh, persons in the country, essentially. And I can tell you every epi study we do where for both of these diseases, uh, bronchiectasis and NTM, we're getting very close to that, and we will be over it soon. So uh, those of you out there who are thinking about developing drugs in the orphan drug pathway, you should start now. <laughs> but maybe you guys could just comment a little bit about that, because I, I do think it's interesting and people might, might appreciate understanding it more. Just keep the number at 199. That'll be helpful. Um, so we, we're, we're a medical device. Um, we used to be a drug, and, and we got, became a device in September, um, luckily. Um, we don't care about orphan drug status on the device side. It's actually, for the devices, it's actually a negative um, to get that status, so we don't have it, and if you're, doesn't matter what the number is for us, but for drugs, they, you wanna keep it low. Um, so orphan drug status is good. If we did have it, we, no one else could come with a nitric oxide therapy for seven or 10 years, depending on whether you can get an extra three. Um, so it's a good thing, and it's an incentive for rare diseases. Um, but uh, on the device side, it, it doesn't exist. Um, it exists in such a fashion that you don't want to have it. 
Um, but the device pathway is a little simpler. Um, it's just uh, uh, two studies for us, a pilot study and a pivotal study, so it's a little bit more rapid. And the device division uh, is, uh, I think if Jurgen went through the device division, they might have got approved, uh, honestly. I think the device division is a little bit different in how they look at things. Um, but uh, Kevin, I'm not sure if, what else you want to know about the device pathway, but they're, yeah, I mean, they're just, they're just a little bit more lenient. They're, they're, they're more concerned with safety and do no harm to the patient. They want to see some efficacy, of course, but they're not quite as stringent as the drug arm of the, uh, of the FDA. Yes, Kevin mentioned, you know, if, so what does orphan status mean from a FDA regulatory perspective? It essentially means that the FDA is committed to looking at these drugs very quickly and having, having a shorter review time. So in that respect, certainly it's important because the sooner you can get the drug uh, into patients' hands, the better it is. Obviously, once you, uh, as you move forward and more and more patients can benefit from it, that's, you know, our, our goal is certainly not to limit the number of, of individuals that have it, but making sure that the correct patient get, you know, get the drug. So what's next after re resistant patients who have NTM-MAC? Um, there's, a, there's a whole host of other NTM diseases and lung diseases. I think it's certainly on us to really understand what that looks like through you, through the physicians. So while well, orphan status is certainly a, a uh, uh, an appealing aspect from a regulatory perspective, I think as you know, we bring it to the market, getting it into the right, uh, to the right patients and making sure that physicians are aware of the disease and, what the, um, and the attributes of the drug is, is the most important thing to us as an organization. I have one more comment. It, orphan drug is certainly very important, but when you look at the landscape of drugs that are being developed, many companies, even the large companies, have moved into the orphan space. Uh, I think it's sometimes even more important to, to know what other regulatory designations are possible, like the qualified infectious disease product designation, which gives you priority review, which orphan drug does not give you, for instance, or breakthrough designations. They were utilized for cystic fibrosis. They were utilized for non-cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis. And even more important is this, to talk to the FDA and, and build a relationship with the FDA and hopefully form a team. This is much more important because the regulators can still decide how they apply these designations to your individual drug development project or to the benefit of the patients. Thank you. Uh, let's just open up to the to the uh, to the audience for questions. Questions? Yep. Hi. First, I want to say thank you to everyone that presented today, and for you gentlemen to present this open forum for the patients to ask and ask questions. Um, my question is. As the evidence shows, most of the NTM patients are older, which means we're on Medicare and fixed incomes. Um, most of the drug companies don't offer assistance to those of us on Medicare Part D. And so, it, for me, it contributes to non-compliance. Uh, two of my inhalers cost $100 a month. I have very good Medicare Part D insurance but that's my share of costs. So is any thought of that given um, when people prescribe medications or are there um, avenues out there for us to get assistance? So uh, take this one? Sure. Um, when it, whenever the, the, the clinic and the physician write the prescription and it comes to us as the pharmacy, um, we're going to, first thing we're going to do is we're going to check the benefit, do the benefits investigation, find out which, what Medicare, whether it's Part D or Part D, will pay for and what they won't, and then we'll work with you to try to navigate you through that. Um, I'd love to say it's, it's going to be rosy. Unfortunately, a lot of times it's not. However, what we do and what, my, what our case managers do, and, and, and Jesse Heaton's our Vice President of Operations, he's here for pharmacy. Um, what they're going to do is they're going to seek out any and all options for you, whether it's through foundations or some type of programs that can be offered. So, you know, when you work with a pharmacy like us, and there's others like me, like us throughout the country, 
um, we're going to do everything we can and lift every rock and turn over every rock to help you through that. Sometimes we get great results and, and sometimes we don't. We wish we could get great results all the time, but, we, but at least working with a pharmacy like us, a, a, a pulmonary subspecialty pharmacy, those case managers are going to know at their fingertips all the programs and all the, all the value adds and all the foundations that are there to support you as compared to going to a, a pharmacy that doesn't even know what NTM is. Um, so every, every one that you touch in our company, whether it's the case managers, whether it's the clinical pharmacists, they know NTM, they'll be able to talk with you on your disease and know what you're going through. So the support's there. Unfortunately, sometimes we always can't get the answers we want because of government pay and what, what we're able to do to assist you. So, do the, we have uh, up there? The, the only thing that I would also add as it relates to airway clearance is that, as you heard from JC, there are lots of different uh, airway clearance therapies, of which many are, are free. And so the importance of airway clearance is to use the one that works and that you use. Um, as it relates specifically to uh, high frequency chest wall oscillation, it is covered by Medicare. Um, there are certain criteria that need to be uh, obtained uh, to include the importance of getting that positive CT scan uh, that shows bronchiectasis. Uh, the physician needs to document in the note two uh, productive cough notes six months apart, and uh, also they need to document uh, a tried and failed. Um, if that is, um, in the patient's note, Medicare will pay for that. Um, the other element is that many of the companies will have uh, financial assistance programs for patients if they have an out-of-pocket cost uh, that can help with that. It's critical that these types of therapies can help patients uh, preserve uh, that pulmonary health. I, I just wanted to add one, one last thing, um, and it was brought up before where the first two doors down from me to the left um, a lot of the medications are off-label, um, and that goes into the cost and what's paid for and what's not. The nice thing is um, the companies like InsMed that are, that are coming out that, knock on wood, get that, get that FDA approval. Once that happens, that changes everything for you on the Medicare Part D, Part V, et cetera, because now you've got an FDA-approved therapy, which now that lessens that burden for, for reimbursement on, on the drug. So. Question from Dr. Olivier. Uh, Bill, if I could ask you, um, what, one of the problems we face right now without having FDA approved drugs um, is a, a problem with recurring shortages, particularly of IV medicines that whose patent has long expired if it ever existed, like for amikacin. Yeah. And I was just wondering if there's a role for specialty pharmacies such as yours uh, that can assist in providing some constancy of availability uh, of drugs like amikacin um, that can kind of help patients ride through this ebb and flow of shortages and restoration of availability of the drugs? Yeah, and the, and the short answer is yes. Um, because of uh, our relationships we have with manufacturers and, and the volume that we do with the, with the amikacins, with the tigercillins, et cetera, um, Jesse's here and he can talk to, with you after. He actually runs the, um, the uh, operations in the pharmacy, but we actually have status where we are guaranteed product um, for to help through those shortages. So if there's ever an issue that you run into, we can probably help you. At least we'll do our darndest and, and we do have the ability to, to help through sh shortages. Because we're not, since this is all we do, we do large volumes as compared to just, you know, a couple prescriptions per month in MTM, NTM or any pulmonary disease. We have, we do thousands and thousands of clistomethate, tagracillin, you know, amikacin, hypertonic saline, et cetera. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. I want to also thank everybody here um, for all the information that is just, it's been a wonderful conference and I thank you very, very much. Even the people that are here that I've had an opportunity to talk to that are fellow um, patients. But um, one of the questions I have, and, and perhaps during some of this it was way over my head, maybe I slept through it, so forgive me if this is a repeat question, but um, 
how, where are we going with stem cell research regarding the diseases of the lungs, perhaps? That was uh, Greg's talk, and you were sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> So that's a question we, we get not infrequently, not only for bronchiectasis patients, but also for COPD, um, for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And um, I'm certainly not an expert in stem cell therapy, but you know, there are, uh, there's a lot of hope that, that stem cell research across the board for diseases of the lung can be effective. They have anti-inflammatory properties, and, and certainly for a disease like bronchiectasis, there may be applicability. The, the, the problem is that that there have uh, there have arisen across the country uh, a number of different lung institutes that purport to give stem cells for a price um, um, in an unregulated really it's outside the tenets of a, of a controlled clinical trial um, and I get this question all the time and I would say that given what's available out there I would I would approach those kinds of um, those kinds of opportunities with, with great caution because there's not a lot of quality control um, and there's no long-term follow-up and it really falls outside the way we like to do research. So I think, um, I think there's opportunities and I think there are lots of institutions around the, around the country that are looking at this in, in the tradition and classic way that has been tried and true over time to, to identify new therapies. I don't think we're there yet, but I think there's, um, there's, there's optimism for the future and we'll look for opportunities to to look for those kinds of clinical trials that will do the subject justice, but we're not we're not quite there yet. And that's certainly um, again open it up to any of the docs um, and the researchers in the audience. But that's that's what my take on the landscape. 